everyone, my name is Nora Crone. I'm a violist in New York City, and today I'm going to be sharing some of the concrete tools I used to recover from musicians' vocal dystonia. A tiny bit of background in case you're new to this channel. I was diagnosed with vocal dystonia in the fall of 2018, and with uh, some personal exploration and the guidance of a violinist named Sophie Till, I recovered fully and returned to professional playing in the fall of 2021. In previous videos, which I will link to down below, I have talked about how I used intentional movement precisely applied to the act of playing the instrument to promote the neuroplastic changes in my brain necessary to overcome dystonia. Uh, in this video, I'm going to get a little deeper into some of the practical tools that I used for recovery, which I'll invite you to try yourself. Now, if you're dealing with a different injury or if you're not injured, you can still stick around to find out more about how you can rewire your brain for healthier and more efficient movement. So the first step in using movement to rewire your brain is knowing exactly what movement you want the brain and the body to reliably produce. And at least in my experience, that movement needs to be considered in the overall context of an approach to playing the instrument and playing music on it that honors inherent physical logic. So early on in my recovery, I spent the better part of a year practicing generic movement exercises that gave me some increased range of motion and muscular control, but they didn't bring me anywhere near full recovery despite the fact that my dystonic symptoms were actually relatively mild. And the reason, from my perspective, was that the dystonic movements were housed in an overall system of playing that was fundamentally problematic and needed to be substantially replaced. Now, I recognize that that might already strike a nerve with some of you, but I invite you to stick around, try this out for yourself, and see what you think. Okay, so how do we recognize fundamentally healthy movement? The most direct answer is usually observing how we use our bodies in daily life. Now, I do have some friends who are Alexander Technique teachers and physical therapists, so I want to acknowledge that many, if not most of us, could improve the way we use our bodies, even in daily life. But I think in the examples I'll be showing you, you'll see how the ways we learn to move in a playing context are so counter to our inherent physical logic that we would never even consider employing them in an everyday context. Let's start with an example in the bow arm. If you play a different instrument, just see if you can hang out and find a way to adapt what I'm talking about to your situation, okay? All right, so everybody hit pause and go get a water bottle or something similarly shaped. Really, go get an object. I promise that you will get infinitely more out of this if you, uh, if you experience it directly. All right, you got it? Great, okay. So hold the water bottle on the end with your left hand and then let your right arm swing freely and plop it onto the water bottle. You can do it a few times. All right, now take a look at your hand. What do you notice? Probably you'll notice that your fingers landed as a team. They probably have a fairly uniform look to them and you probably don't feel any one of them in particular. It just feels like a hole. Your fingers are probably also neither stretched apart nor squeezed together. And actually you can try plopping the arm up to different objects. And what you'll probably notice is that though the objects are different, you have the same experience each time. So this is fundamentally healthy movement and none of us had to take lessons to do it. Now let's try with the bow. So hold it in the middle with the left hand, swing your right arm and plop up to it and see what you notice. Was it the same as with the bottle and the other objects? For many of us, as it was for me before I was introduced to the till approach, it isn't the same experience at all. In contrast, for me, it used to feel like the bow was kind of mesmerizing my hand 
um, into producing a shape on the weight of the bow. Um, and this experience was even stronger in my left arm, which is where the dystonic symptoms were. So you might notice other things in addition to the arrangement of your fingers, like how they feel or how your palm feels. Does it feel stiff? Does it feel soft? Um, or what your shoulder may be doing. So the brain and body can be conditioned to respond automatically in all sorts of different unhelpful ways. Um, you might notice emotional sensations like anxiety or irritation or a sense of trying hard. Um, and with a lot of experience with this type of practice, you may even begin to perceive brain noise, sort of a sense of increased neural excitation. And at first, it can be really disconcerting to see this, that our brain, as a result of deep conditioning, is producing a pattern that we can't even necessarily deactivate right away, even when we want to. The good news is we had to teach ourselves how to move this way, and we can guide ourselves back to healthy movement too. Even better, since our brain and body like movement that feels good and makes sense, and we use it all the time in daily life, they become increasingly happy to go along with the process. So let's try it. Go back to your bottle and just throw your hand up there a few times, maybe let's say three to five times. Notice how it feels, how it looks. And then try again with the bow, but ask your brain to give you the same experience that you had with the bottle. And you can go back and forth. And actually you may already be starting to notice a difference. I wanna pause here and acknowledge that some of you may be thinking, but I can't hold a bow the same way I hold a bottle or a cup or a fork or a toothbrush, right? I mean, it's a special object with a special task. Don't I need to hold it in a special way? And this question comes up with pretty much every aspect of the technique actually. And the answer, believe it or not, is no. Of course, we, we need to learn how to apply healthy movements in increasingly precise ways in order to make them functional in a task as delicate and specific as playing an instrument. But the movements themselves belong in the same experiential category as picking up a bottle and drinking from it, or brushing our teeth, or waving from someone. The minute we abandon that premise, we've entered a world where we suspend the laws of physical logic, and that always leads to trouble. So the first tool for recovering this physical logic in relation to the instrument, which we've just explored, is observing how the body behaves and how we experience that movement in the brain with everyday objects. We can then go about transferring that experience from the object onto the instrument. So I used this tool pretty much constantly during my recovery, and I continue to use it, particularly for teaching. And what we did just now is one tiny example. You can really use your imagination and whatever objects you have around your house to guide the brain toward any functional movement that you're trying to develop. I have a friend who was preparing an orchestra audition while trying to move her brain through a really awful bow arm injury, and she practiced all of her excerpts with a carrot, no joke. Of course, understanding how we take a functional but relatively crude movement and turn it into music is a multi-step process that requires the guidance of someone who's been through it themselves, but it is absolutely possible. The second tool I wanna to introduce you to is a different kind of comparison between the two arms. Now, if you're dealing with, let's say, an embouchure issue, for instance, this might be more challenging to apply, but you can always try comparing your instrument and another object again, or um, comparing the action of preparing a note with a different action, like maybe whistling or blowing out a candle, for example. This time, we'll be working with the left arm, which actually means we're gonna start with the right arm. This is gonna be very strange, are you ready? Okay, grab your instrument and put it on the right side. I know, 
<laughs> Obviously your chin rest and your shoulder rest aren't in the correct place. It feels clumsy and weird. Yes. However, can you feel how natural and unforced the body and the brain are? There's nothing practiced about this, which is why it's actually a great place to observe functional movement. Okay, so now you're just gonna hold on to the instrument with your left hand so it doesn't fall and swing your right arm freely and just let it plop onto the instrument. Do that a few times. And you can go to different places. Probably what you'll notice is that it feels very free and unencumbered. I'm basically just looking at where I want the hand to land and my brain is calculating where and how to send my arm so that my fingers and hand land as a team with a forearm behind them for support. All right, now that we've had our silly time, let's go over to the other side. All right, so now we're gonna plop our instrument on our left shoulder. And the first question is, does it already feel different? And if so, you can start by just going back and forth between and the right and the left. And repeating the same process that we did with the bottle and the bow. When you do it on the left side, consciously place your brain on the experience that you had on the right side and ask it to recreate that. Once you've tried that, you can try swinging the left arm and plopping it up. What do you notice? You can go back and forth if you'd like. How does the shoulder feel? Where does your elbow end up on each side? Now I can't get too deeply into this detail in this video, but many of us we're taught to yank our elbow to the right, when actually our experience with the right arm shows us that being stably on the strings means our elbow ends up here rather than here. Do your fingers land as a unit or do they assume a shape on the way to the instrument? Now you might be thinking, but don't I need a hand frame? And the response to that is, do you leave your fingers down and move them individually in any other activity? Like I said before, it would be impossible to explain every aspect of the till approach in this video, but just know that there is a way to play that lets our hand and fingers operate the same way they do everywhere else as a unit with the support of the forearm. So that's comparing the two arms. And obviously you can apply this to bow arm issues as well in any scenario you can imagine. The fact that our opposite arm knows nothing about the instrument or the bow is actually of great value to us. And in fact, it turns out that that arm usually has a lot to teach us about healthy movement. So those are our two modes of comparison, which are both excellent tools for recovery. If you found this video helpful, I would love it if you would like it and subscribe, and please feel free to share it with others. If you wanna contact me or just wanna know more about me, my website is www.norakrone.com. In future videos, I'll share more concrete tips and some general guidance for navigating the experience. But in closing, I'll say that from my point of view, by far the most efficient and reliable way to recover from musician's focal dystonia is by working directly with someone whose approach to playing has been proven effective in that context and who can help guide the process according to your unique situation. Recovery is not easy, but with the right resources, it's totally possible. I'm sending you the best. Take care. See you next time.